So it's always a pleasure to be a director, see everybody working hard to not just uh, advance the theory, but also find practical applications. And hopefully we can report to you one of the, one of the as we hope, major applications of AI, which is search in the data. So as it was mentioned, so I'm a part of Chemio Lab. So these are some of our members and some of our partners. So you, I'm sure you recognize Graham, for example under there, so these are students and postdocs. Uh, so we are relatively small ones, a small lab. We are entirely focused on medical images and we don't do anything but image search. So we have one project and that's image search since uh, four years, searching in medical images. So medical imaging is a tough field to be in because it has a diversity of modality, different type of data. So we cannot really specialize in all of them because each one of them has a different set of complexity and intricacies that you can, you have to basically go in detail in order to be able to customize your methods from MR to ultrasound to CD to OCT to pathology images to X-ray to PET and many other modalities that are emerging. So we have roughly 700 billion images per year just in US. US is pretty much 50% of the world market in anything, including medical images. So. If you have something to offer, you have to just go to the U.S. because this is the big market to start to start from. So, um, and of course, uh, when you talk about big data, medical imaging is really the best manifestation of that. Uh, so things are starting from one petabyte upwards. So we have roughly two trillion medical images per year. Uh, that's approximately 450 exabytes, which by law, uh, many hospitals have to keep the images for at least 10 years. So that's, you're talking 4.5 zettabytes of data. So if I just look at one surgical lab, so which processes 50,000 patients a year, so that's at least a petabyte of data for one pathology lab. So comparing with Wikipedia is 10 terabyte, and the Large Hydron Collider generates 15 petabytes per year. The web, including everything, including videos and graphics and everything, is around one zettabyte. So medical imaging on one side, entire web one on the other side, I am guessing medical imaging will win with respect to the size of the images. So what can AI do with images? So this is a question that we're asking ourselves and looking at this histopathology image, of course you can classify and you look at the literature, the majority of works are doing classification which is fundamentally yes and no. Even if you do grading, if you do grading and staging of cancer images, this is still fundamentally yes and no decision. This is, a, this, is a, this is a limitation that I try to raise and some of the colleagues don't like to hear that because classification is convenient and we, we, are, we have grown really good at classification. Of course, you can generate data. And this is something exciting. This has not been possible up to five, six years ago. Uh, and uh, you can segment, traditional, comes from computer vision, has usually been done with handcrafted techniques. And of course, what we do, you can search. You can search in the data. And the, the main thing is for us to realize that a group of techniques are supervised. Classification, generation, segmentation, they are fundamentally supervised techniques. Whereas search, the core part of the search, when you go and try to identify images, when an input image is given, is unsupervised. So you don't train anything for search. You, you may have features that have been trained, but they have not been trained for your specific search. So search itself is inherently unsupervised. And that's what it makes it exciting for us because we know that down the road, that the strong AI, that artificial general intelligence has to be has to be uh, uh, predominantly unsupervised. So discovering and identifying patterns without requesting for millions of samples. So, um, okay, so if I, if I go a little bit more detail, so if I look at the pathologist looking at images, basically there are two different approaches to help the pathologist. One is we give him or her the AI software which makes decisions, yes or no. Fundamentally yes or no decision. Is this cancer, it's not cancer. So, and if I do that, basically I'm implying that I wanna get rid of pathologists, even if I don't say it, which is, which is nonsense. We don't wanna, we don't wanna uh, get rid of pathologists. They have a lot of knowledge. And by the way, we can't get rid of them. The reason is who should, who should write the report if you get rid of the pathologists? Because it's not just that you say it is cancer. So 
radiologists, pathologists, oncologists, cardiologists, they have to write extensive reports, justify their decision with a lot of domain knowledge that they have. So even if we use classification, we should ref refrain from that mindset that now I'm doing the job of the doctor. We don't want to do the job of the doctor. We want to we want to serve. So as an AI community, we want to really be, I know that's tough for us and our egos, but we want to serve. We want to be the servant of the medical community. So if we understand that and internalize that, things will start to happen. The same software, the same technique, I can take it to search, which is interesting. So the same set of technology I can, I can uh, use to establish and find and identify cases and show it to the pathologist. Basically, you reinforce the pathologist to write better reports. Everybody's happy. We sell our software, we get our recognition, the doctors doesn't feel threatened, which is the business side of things. But we have, if you're seriously interested in getting AI into the medical community, we have to recognize the competency of the clinicians. Classification is emphasizing decision-making. We should be clear about that. This is not cats and dogs that we recognize. It's cancer. So, and people are doing that all day long. But search and retrieval emphasizes on virtual peer review. That, that's some, somewhat new. We are not used to that in AI community. We are used to, we have capable techniques, we make decisions for you. So, okay. Can AI replace the human expert? Well, I have to go back to Alan Turing, basically, because he taught us the Turing task, that in order to know that a computer piece of a computer program is intelligent or not, basically a human being has to validate that. So the human being is the ultimate validator of AI, which means to me, well, there is no full automation ever possible. Because if you have labeled data, the human has given you that knowledge, that, that uh, internal domain knowledge. So why should we push this? If we know that we are depending on humans, the human is the ultimate validator for, uh, for AI, means AI can never be smarter than humans. The AI can be at best as intelligent as the human operator. At least the supervised AI cannot be. Maybe if you come up with the unsupervised class of techniques, Maybe they can grow their own intelligence. So if I look at histopathology images like this, a thymoma case, which could be benign or malignant, so if I give that to a good pathologist, I will get a full, complete report. I will get the description, the anatomy, the histology, the measurements, the guesses, recommendations for treatment. I get all that. If I give it to AI, I get the diagnosis. Don't get upset. I'm in AI too, so I'm not attacking AI. I'm just saying this is not a comparison. So we should not try to do that because at the moment we cannot replace the clinician. At the moment we are way behind the clinician with respect the way that human beings apply knowledge. So if I ask my AI technique, why? Why do you say that? How do you say that? Or what are the problems? What are the uncertainties? What are your recommendations? Well, I need additional 10 years and 50 other PhDs to maybe get some of it done. So we are not there yet. We are not there to generate this. Please and don't say LSTM. LSTM cannot do this because nobody has 10 million reports to learn the sophisticated language that goes into the clinical report writing. We are not there yet. So, and we will destroy our chances to really get things done if we promise things that we cannot do. So we know that you're, what we have is big AI because we learn specific things with millions of cases and we want to go toward the strong AI. Everybody talks about that, human level knowledge, multitasking, even ethical questions and even machines that have consciousness. Uh, three years ago, if you would use consciousness in conjunction with AI, your tenure would get revoked. But no people openly talk about it. We want to have AI with consciousness. We, that's because of the recent success, of course. So that the AI that we have right now is fundamentally based on feed-forward layered networks, which is fantastic. But we know that we have to go in the direction of something like this. We, we need to go in direction of connected graphs because this is more realistic of the little that we know about, about the human brain. So we, we should know where we are and where we want to go. So why search? Why search? Well, if I have a gigantic database and we have billions of images, we have, we have those two trillion images per year, 
I can send that query image to that gigantic database and hopefully there is a smart AI algorithm that gives me back the images that are similar to my case, give me back, find similar patients that uh, uh, are really corresponding to my patient. But so what? If you show a similar image to a, to a doctor, you will say, so what? I see that they are similar. So what is your point? So where is the value of searching for similar patterns? Well, if I, if I come back to my field at the moment, so if I have AI algorithm that can operate on the big data, which is not a given, I will give you some, some, uh, uh, some uh, problems that we, at the moment we cannot easily apply AI on, on histopathology. If I send a suspicious region that I don't know what that is, and you send me back similar cases, and I'm definitely impressed. Yeah, fantastic that you can find in such a large archive, you can find similar plan. But what is your point? The point is the annotated data that comes with the image. Because those images are saved with pathology reports, with treatment plans, with the outcome. This is immense level of human knowledge. But nobody is using those reports. Why we are not using it? Because they don't provide labeled data. And we are addicted to labeled data. So if the metadata is detached from the actual data, we just don't touch those type of applications, which is a pity, of course. So what we are actually doing image search right now, so pathologists, radiologists, oncologists do consult each other. They sit down, talk about difficult cases. And what happens if I show a patient, if I show the image of one of my patients to you, what happens in the human brain? We do compare images. We have no idea how we do it explicitly. But implicit search and comparison and matching happens in the human brain. And you remember images that you have seen from med school to your residency onto your 10 years of experience in histopathology. So we are doing this as humans. Why we cannot imitate that process? Okay, so we created some... Uh, four years ago, a project, uh, Utixel, uh, so putting the word one Uta pixel together, which is roughly equivalent to 40 trillion whole site images of 100,000 by 100,000 pixels. So that's the vision. We want to be there that we can process one Uta pixel in real time. That's a, that's a really ambitious project. Ontario government is supporting Chemia Lab and Huron Digital Pathology. The only Canadian manufacturer for pathology scanners is our industry sponsor. So the point is that when you do biopsy and you take a sample from human body, you put it on the glass slide after some processing, after staining and cleaning and everything. Uh, you put it on those glass slides and you give the glass slides to the pathologist, he or she puts it under the microscope and does diagnosis, writes the report, and after he or she is done, it, it will go into the archive. You go to the basement of any hospitals, you see the nightmare of the administrations. Millions upon millions of those glass slides that contain biopsy samples. Well, we can digitize them, and people have started to digitize them. At the moment, 95% of the pathologists are still hugging their microscope because there is an immense scientific image attached to microscope. Science is microscope. They don't want to give it up and use a uh, 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 screen, among others. There are other reasons, financial reasons, concerns about clinical accuracy and all that. So whole slide imaging, which is I put my glass slide under the, in a scanner and you make it a digital image, suddenly I can apply the entire repository of computer vision and get things done, hopefully help pathologists to their job. So if I look at this image, this is a uh, lobular, breast lobular carcinoma, uh, roughly, if I remember correctly, 65,000 by 80,000 pixels. So if I zoom in, the, most of it is, uh, is fat, zoom in, zoom in, this is the ugly part, which seems, which looks so beautiful. This is the cancerous part. Zoom in, zoom in. So you can zoom in actually to, to recognize the edges of every cell nucleus. And that's what they do. They go back and forth, back and forth to analyze stuff. So, okay, uh, what are the challenges? So why we cannot easily apply AI in histopathology? Histopathology is interesting because this is the end of it. This is the end of diagnosis. Radiology do, does not do diagnosis. Radiology is a guess. I'm sorry if radiologists are sitting here. Radiology is, a, is rendering impressions. Pathology is definitive diagnosis. There is nobody after pathologist. Pathology says it's cancer and recommends 
in conjunction with uh, medical physicists and oncologists should be surgery and chemo afterwards. So is, is the last, is the end of it. So why we cannot help them? One, one, one problem is that there is no label data. This is thyroid carcinoma and that circle that I put around the main part, so is the label, but there is no such a thing in reality. The images are not labeled. Those millions of images, they are not labeled. So, but you look in the publicly available data set, they are all labeled. Why? Because we have to publish. So we ask a pathologist to come on board, we pay them $50,000 for two months, whatever. So please create some database for me, mark the cancerous region, such that I can create my yes and no regions for my deep network, and then we can get things done. Fantastic, from academic perspective. Poisonous for the practice, because we cannot go to the practice, because when you go to the practice, to the millions of images that are available, they are not labeled. So you cannot generalize unless you have a, you have a comprehensive representative uh, set of images. Marking, delineating the cancerous region in the image. In the image, you know what is the doctor looking for? What is it? So, but we have this image and we have some report, no label. So th this, is, this is a problem in general in medical imaging, but particularly in, in histopathology. Another problem is the gigantic dimensionality of these images. So these images can easily get, every image is two, three gigabyte. You cannot even load it at once into the memory. But the literature works with patches, with tiny patches. You, you see paper, papers, they use 128 by 128 pixels. This, this, is, this is by far, this is so far from reality of the histopathology. So, and if you work with patches, you have to work with all of them, not just some of them. So you have to understand this whole slide image in its entirety, the way that the pathologist does but which deep network can I use to feed in 100,000 by 100,000 pixel? None at the moment. So we have to come up with some other ideas to do it. And another challenge is the, just the gigantic pattern diversity and polymorphism that is in histopathology. Just the search space is intractable. There are so many different patterns. If you just grab the same carcinoma, the same type of problem, it can be manifested in many different shapes. So it's not like cats and dogs. It's more complicated than cats and dogs to recognize. So, okay, so what, another problem is the, the feature calculation. Even if I grab one of those patches, and those patches cannot be, if you're gonna be realistic, they cannot be smaller than thousand by thousand. And you cannot downsample. If you downsample for every level of downsampling, you lose two, three percent of accuracy. So these are limitations. So you get, you get features for that part, get any features, get SIFT, get deep features, the dense net, whatever features you wanna get. But I will get every of those features is 1024, let's say, if you're compact, so it's four kilobyte. For this image, you get roughly 4,500 of those patches, which is 180 megabyte. So you have 180 megabyte features. So do you wanna save those 180 megabyte? Yeah, sure, I save it. Well, we can't, because these images are big enough. Hospitals are already struggling with the data. They will not buy software that requires for every image additional 180 megabyte of storage. I know this is an academically irrelevant point, because nobody at the conference that I submit paper to will question that my feature extractor needs 180 megabyte per image. I know that. But are we serious about getting AI into the hands of hospitals or not? So why not using some sort of barcodes? So why not moving toward binary information? So the ups and downs of deep features, for example, could be used as some sort of min-max barcoding, among others, to create binary information. So not features, but zeros and ones. So then I can look at this long adenocarcinoma and grab smartly some patches and convert them to barcodes. So if I can do that, then that gigantic 100,000 by 100,000 pixel image becomes a bunch of barcodes. So I can send 50 barcodes, which is nothing. I can send it from across network. I can, I can search super fast. So last experiments we did, we can, we can search in 100 million images per second if we use barcodes. 
So no problem, no GPU is necessary. Of course, we can now go back and say, oh, we have deep networks, fantastic. Let's generate barcodes with them. Yes, but I don't want to use the classification. I don't want to use the classification part. Transfer learning is the keyword, the magical word for us. Yes, all those the uh, image net, deep network, dense network, inceptions ones that we have trained now become really useful. So, of course, I can just grab those patches and put them in some sort of autoencoders and grab from any level, grab different type of barcodes. Yes, now we, we become really sustainable and we become realistic how we can represent histopathology images. Now, okay, so give you another example that we are not dismissing the conventional computer vision. This is one danger that I see that we are doing in the AI community. We are fast and saying, okay, now we don't need handcrafted features anymore. I don't want to let go of handcrafted features as of yet. I want to keep them because they are interpretable. Maybe I can combine them with deep features. So I, gra I can grab all those patches. I can come up with some sort of projections. I can find the maximum amplitude of the projections, which means something for the signal. I can find the anchor angle, the most important angle. I can add some other projections on top of it. I can build the gradient. I can binarize it. I can convert it back to integers, and I can create a histogram. LBP does that. LBP is very successful. Before deep learning came along, the best we had for many recognition techniques was LBP plus SVM. Sure, why not? And it's interpretable for the doctor. So, and of course I can put it, I can transfer it, transform it, convert it to a barcode as well. Anything can be transformed into a barcode. So we did that, and as you can see, a method like this, a, a handcrafted feature like this in conjunction with a classifier like SVM can beat some of the deep networks like VGG. I know, we have better ones, meanwhile, VGG is now grown old, but it, this shows that we cannot easily dismiss still the handcrafted features. So, and sometimes, strangely, we saw the experiment that, that the deep barcodes are even better than the uh, deep features themselves, which was a very strange discovery for us. And in some cases, it seems converting deep features to binary information is getting rid of noise somehow. And then you are, you see that deep features are 68 percent and the deep barcodes are 71 percent for this case. So, so I'm, I'm relying on something that is fundamentally reliable, which is how can I convert deep features to deep barcodes? So this is something that we're working on it. Uh, uh, definitely, tr yes. Yeah, but the deep, uh, which one are we talking about? Which one are we talking about here? Yes, his handcrafted features is slightly better than VGG features, yes. Yes, which is a still an argument against that network because if handcrafted features can be as good as you in conjunction with a classifier, so that means I would not, as of yet, completely dismiss handcrafted features. Why not? So if you have if you have good features, handcrafted features, and you have a capable classifier like SVM, of course, why not? I think that's a bias that we think. Why? I I don't know why. I know that in the in handcrafted features we put a lot of domain knowledge, and that matters. If you if you are capable of putting domain knowledge into a handcrafted features. For many years, we live, we, we just use SIFT. From A to Z, we cannot even explain some of the steps of the SIFT. Nobody still knows why SIFT worked, but it worked. And it just actually gave a gigantic boost to the computer vision community. Suddenly, we were able to do object recognition. So, uh, and you see, when, when we, when we do transfer learning, actually going like, look, look at the, at the inception version three, if you just use the D feature, of course, you get 70%. If you do some sort of fine tuning, you get a little bit more, 75%. Yeah, we know that. 
But still, for the fine tuning, I need some sort of label data, which may not be available in our case. So that, that's an argument. So, and you can, you can generate, of course, you can use some sort of generative models to generate images. If that helps us, if you have recognized some labels, can we generate synthetic images to compensate for the lack of label data? That's a motivation for us to, uh, to work on. And simple things, computer vision things that may not be of interest at, the large, uh, at large with the AI community is sustained. Color normalization may not be very interesting to us. But color normalization, which is a stain normalization in histopathology, it has chemical meaning. Hematoxylene reacts with the cell nuclei. Aerozine reacts with cytoplasm. It has chemical meaning. We cannot ignore domain knowledge. This mindset that just give me a million label data and I will figure it out, that's not going to work. Because even if you give me 99% accuracy, then the doctor will say, why? And then I have to, accept, I have to answer why. So patch clustering is something that we are really focused on and we try to understand how do we cluster patch with unsupervised learning. Techniques like self-organizing maps, which in my perception is being widely ignored in literature. So how can I get those 4,000, 3,000, 2,000 patches of the image on the left and then put them in different clusters in the middle and then come up with a more compact representation of every cluster so I have a good representation for every tissue type in the gigantic 100,000 by 100,000 pixel image. So we did that and we realized if you work with the entire image, you can get accuracy of 69% in this case. And if you just grab 10% of it, you drop to 58%. So it's not easy. It's not easy to compress reduce the dimensionality of medical data without losing uh, uh, accuracy. And that's something that we have to take very seriously. So this is another work that we are doing in the lab. And so we take the image, we segment it, we mask it, we patch it, and then we do some statistical analysis on it. And we grab those patches on the left, uh, bottom left, the dependent patches, the ones that are marked. Uh, so still we are trying different techniques, statistical learning, uh, unsupervised clustering, starting from k-means to self-organizing maps and other things. How can I find a set of representative parts for the gigantic image that such that I don't lose information? That's that's a challenging thing. Okay, so how can I how can I search? Well, you can search. You should be able to search if I give you the entire image. That's a tough one. I give you the entire image. The image is again eighty thousand by eighty thousand pixel. Can you show me? Similar images, if I give you the entire image. What does that even mean? How can you compare two gigantic images with each other? Why? Well, you need really a good representation. Patch is easy. So I give you a small patch within the image and you go and compare it. And region must, must be a little bit more difficult. So if I give you an irregular shaped uh, uh, shape, so you should be able to go. So if you want to offer image search, you should be able to offer all of it because Every application is different. So, okay, what is then? What, why using AI for image search? Because AI for image search is fundamentally giving us the virtual peer review. So if I'm looking, if a pathologist is looking at its image and you send that image to image search engine and that engine will go and find three cases that are similar to your images and definitely you see, you realize similar doesn't mean similar shape is the content, is the tissue types that are similar in those images. So if I do that, why is that virtual peer review? Because first of all, those images that you find come with pathology reports. There is a lot of knowledge in those reports. And there is somebody who is asking that question. There's a pathologist who gave you the query and say, have you seen an image like this? And the images that we find have been processed by other people. So now AI is not making any decision. AI just making the knowledge available to you to be used. So I found three cases that are very similar to you. I don't know, papillary, thyroid papillary carcinoma. And so now I have the knowledge. It can, uh, we, want, we don't want to throw the reports at the user. We want to process them, maybe put them in form of a set of keywords or something, maybe auto captioning, something nice, user friendly. So that's why we, we focus on image search, so trying to make the existing knowledge available. 
Again, so you have to really process the pathology reports. If you want to combine, let's say, if you search and find the top 10 similar cases, you have 10 reports to combine. How do you combine that? You cannot combine that unless you first do your homework, clean it up, find keywords, find topics, all the things that we do in NLP. And then hopefully we can display one or two sentences or 10 keywords that describe the new image that nobody has seen. So now you tell me there is no intelligence in that if you can do this. So, okay, what is the ultimate? What is the ultimate goal for image search? So if you have a query, all slide image, and we find the top three, top five, top 10 with, with annotated information, basically we are able to do computational consensus. So now this is not a decision that you say yes and no. You find the top 10 and all of them are saying from the top, from the top 10, eight are saying papillary carcinoma. Okay, papillary carcinoma it is. Not my decision. The similarity of your pattern with the diagnosis of your own colleagues is saying that. So I wash my hands. I just help you to find it. Yes. Did you take a, like a picture of a healthy tissue? Well, we, we can find you healthy tissue in different body organs, but the, the, the merging of the reports doesn't make sense because uh, you have to, the query has to be something malignant for the reports fusion to make sense. I will show you actually at the end, if you're lucky and I can run the demo, I show you one example what I mean. So we are, we are, uh, we are working on different data sets. One is from University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, Dr. Leon Plantanovitz, uh, one of the pioneers of digital pathology in the US. So in that data set, we have 85 different type of cancer. So it's not yes and no, it's 85 different with a lot of variation. We're also using the TCGA uh, data set of 11,000 patients, is more than 33,000 images. Not many people are using that data set. 33,000 whole slide images, that, that's roughly 500 million regular images. You should say AI researchers should go insane about this data set, but not many people are using that. Why? Because it's not labeled. It's just image, report, image, report, which is a gigantic opportunity for us. So showing you some search results. So if the query image comes on the left and I'm showing you the top three, salivary gland. So according to the classification scheme, only the first and second match are correct because the diagnosis is correct. But the last one we cannot dismiss because there is still similarity. So we have to show it to the pathologist and say, I found something similar. It's a different diagnosis, but okay, this is your domain. You take a look. We don't make decisions for image search. Same here for kidney. Uh, the input on the left comes, I find the top three. The first two are not only organ-wise correct, but also diagnosis is correct. But the last one, the diagnosis is different. But can I dismiss it? or I see similar pattern in the morphology. What does that tell us? We don't know because nobody has done this. So we have to give this in the hand, take this in the hand of the doctors. They can work with it for a while and they will come up with ideas what that means. It is not our domain. We have no idea what that means. Okay, so at the moment we are working on many different things. One of them is actually we want to go back, even if it sounds like blasphemy, we want to rediscover shallowness. Can we design shallow networks? Why shallow? Well, if I input some domain knowledge, in, for, for example, in terms of projection of my pattern, can I come up with shallow networks that give me the possibility to easily try, easily learn, but also my input is interpretable if based on the classification. So we did that and it seems compared to the initial, let's say a regular MLP, it, it works. So we are not competing with this with deep networks. We wanna see if I put in uh, conventional domain knowledge, not raw data, so you extract features. So we are going away from the current, from the current tendency. Can I come up with interpretable shallow networks for medical imaging? So that's one thing that we are working on. This was accepted for IEEE conference on neural networks in, in Budapest this year. So another thing that we are working on is to come up with a network that is more realistic implementation of what we know about the brain. So we come up with, with some sort of graph uh, mini uh, uh, perceptron that maybe we can put together and 
uh, design a, a, a classes uh, networks like this. So at the moment, if we apply gradient descent, we, we seem to be doing okay. If the if the graph is small, if we have if we have dependencies of input and outputs, accents and then whites, we get into trouble with gradient descent. So we are working on that. So just just two of the things that at the moment we are from research perspective trying to get our heads around it. So this project has been has been supported by many people. Uh, first of all, Ontario government which funded us for the next five years. Euron Digital Pathology, Vector, UHN, UPMC, Grand River Hospital, Dell EMC, MITAX, and CERC, of course, many others. So I'm, I, I would like to show you a, uh, a live demo when I, I got the permission from the, that company, Huron Digital Pathology, to connect with VPN to their server and show it. I hope it, it's, uh, there is no problem. I have a backup just in case it doesn't run, okay? It seems to be running. So, okay, so this is, this is an image search engine that was just displayed at the OSCAP, which is the largest pathology conference uh, worldwide. So, and it was showed there for the first time. So you can open any, any of them is a biopsy sample. I opened this one, which is gigantic. So you see the latency. Uh, so this is, this is a salivary gland, which has been diagnosed if you look at the, uh, top left, basal cell adenocarcinoma, but if this is my input, it has not been diagnosed yet. We don't know what that is. You see that by default on the left-hand side, by the default, the software has searched for similar biopsy sample and has listed them real time. It happened just when I opened it. Because again, we can do a million patients per second. So, and if you, any latency that you see is the network latency. So the first one, at the moment, because this database is small, there is no threshold of similarity, we show everything. Because if I put a threshold on it, uh, since the database is small, in many cases, we cannot show anything because there is not enough diversity to show something. The first match that you see, patient nine, salivary gland diagnosis is basal cell adenocarcinoma. If I, if I look at that, the computer is saying this patient who has been diagnosed two weeks ago, two years ago, five years ago, and we have the reports and everything, is similar to my patient for whatever reason. Of course, as a good pathologist, I don't trust to that global similarity check. I want to go in detail. So I can go and maybe zoom in, and I want to take a look at some of the healthy tissue. So I drop my search patch here and say, please search, and the search is happening in real time. So you find similar patches. And of course, again, since we don't have any threshold here, we show everything that the software finds. So we show, this is happening within almost a million images in real time, which is, speed-wise, it's okay. It's not, it's not super impressive for one million images. So, and as you see, so I'm, this is healthy tissue, and I'm searching in salivary gland. By default, the software searches only in that organ. But I can ask if I look at the right-hand side here, I can force the software to search in everything, which means across all body organs. Just don't search in salivary gland. If I do that, you see that the search results are different, and maybe I find better matches because this part is healthy tissue. It's not malignant. So you can find it in many body parts. So if I go in and I can search, I can search for, uh, for fat if you're interested in fat. Uh, I can search in for connective tissue, fiber glandular tissue, uh, anything that is, again, so if you see, again, it's going back to searching in the same organ salivary gland, I can force it again, no, please go and search in everything. I may find better matches because now I'm searching in all body parts in one million cases. So, and of course, I'm actually interested in this part, which is the nasty part, which is the carcinoma part. If I drop my cases here, now this is, this is the search that makes sense coming back to you. Uh, this is, this is a malignant part, and the report was written for this part. So now I see that it's finding patient nine, patient nine, patient eight, patient nine. So the first two are saying this is basal cell carcinoma, which happens to be the right one. So now I can get, and I see that I have the third one again, and here, basal cell carcinoma, the fourth result. So if I just go with the first four, three of them are unanimous, this is basal cell carcinoma. Again, say, okay, I have a majority vote. Uh, 
So one of the ways that you can, you can evaluate image search is validation through majority vote. But that's concentrated on diagnosis. You may have the wrong diagnosis, but still the similar morphology is providing some information. So the validation of image search is not as straightforward. That's our challenge. So we can treat it like classification, which is not fair, because it has not been trained to classify. So again, I can go back and basically grab anything. So I can grab, I don't know, this one is brain. So brain glioblastoma. When I open it, you see immediately that the first search result, patient 63, software says this is similar to yours, which is also glioblastoma. So I can again look at that, say, yeah, you see, the similarity is such a funny business. So this is, has a much more intensive staining, but the software saying it is similar to mine. Okay, so again, I'm a good pathologist. I will zoom in. I will go back and forth. I want to drop my search and say, yeah, this is the nasty part. So what about this guy? So I search and you see 63, 63, 63. The software saying your patient is very, very similar to patient 63 who was diagnosed two and a half years ago by Dr. Ritz. So now I can go in that and say, yeah, this one really looks similar to me. Where is it? It brings me to that location say so it's here. So you can go back and forth between what you have and what you're looking for to see why the software is saying this is glioblastoma. Not a difficult case. Brain is generally relatively easy for pathologists. There are lymphoma is tough, sarcoma is tough. Carcinoma, generally easy, generally easy. So, but the most impressive thing, hopefully, that I can show you, so we ask our uh, clinical partners to challenge us. They said, give us something difficult because we don't know how to deal. So they send us this. This is a kidney uh, biopsy sample. And usually you see those sm small pieces. That happens. The come biopsy and could be multiple pieces on one glass slide. But here, th this is something strange. This is something strange. Because as you see, this small part, it has a distinct nasty structure. This is carcinoma. But the other big part actually doesn't look like that. So the other big part is free from that nasty cancer. So what? Two possibilities. Either somebody messed up the biopsy and put the needle in the wrong place, so I didn't get enough sample from the cancerous part, so I get only a small part, or the small part is coming from another patient. How can it come from another patient? Through the staining and processing. Because we put those glass lights in many liquids, in staining, in alcohol, in hematoxylene, in eosine, so it can be that small, tiny part detached and get attached to another patient. Oh, that's bad. Of course it's bad. It's called floater problem. So floater, the piece of tissue that floats in the liquid and gets attached. Good, how can we resolve this? Well, we can do DNA testing. So I get DNA from that piece, from that piece, we send it to DNA testing, wait three days, pay $5,000, then we have the clarification, yeah, okay, they are two different persons. Okay, the kidney person is okay, can go home. This guy, we already diagnosed everything okay. So sometimes they don't want to pay for the DNA testing. They go get, if this small part is from this, from this lab, then we should have processed that patient two hours ago, yesterday, two days ago. It must be in the system. Okay, bring me back 100 glass slides that we have processed. Somebody sits down, puts the glass slides one by one under the microscope, compare it with this, whether they see a similar pattern. Image search a la human beings. Uh, not very common, one to two percent of the cases. But, uh, but uh, when it happens, it's a huge headache. What makes it interesting for us, this is a fantastic validation case. Because if that patient, that piece of nasty uh, case is in the system, actually we should be able to find it. We should be able to find it. Okay, great, so let's find it. Well, it doesn't find it. Why not? Well, the input is kidney. The software by default searches in kidney. Who says that piece comes from kidney? If it is from another patient, it can be from anybody part. You cannot search in kidney alone. You can search everywhere. Okay, let me search everywhere. The first two and the fourth one are correct. So if I look at the patient 299, this is actually a colon cancer patient that we processed two days ago. Oh, okay, no DNA test necessary. 
image search to the rescue. This is what AI can do. When we show this to the pathologists, absolute majority of them, if not some of them, don't want to show their enthusiasm for this. So this is why we, we are convinced that searching is intelligence. Really, you can recognize tissue. If you can recognize tissue, you must be intelligent. Good. So I guess I guess we are done. So thank you very much. And I was lucky. Everybody, everything was everything was running. Thank you.